systematically how it's being destroyed. So the first thing you be, need to be concerned about is if you live in urban areas uh, or you live in if you're, uh, the poor people who will get hit first, but pollution cuts across all lines. So anyway, why not leave it to the state agencies? Apart from the fact that Ohio has made a, a, an art form out of trying to get around enforcement, why not <coughs> leave it to the state agencies? This is where we came in. in the six, I mean, uh, The Silent Spring was written in 1962. And it began to dawn on people over the next eight years or so that uh, we really needed to <coughs> think about the interconnected nature of things. And then we began to pass this network over the over the 70s and you know into the actually into the 80s. But uh, uh, people got worked up when uh, a lot of Indian. Hindu uh, people in India were killed by in Bhopal. So we did pass a law in 1986 which said you had to tell people about the uh, freight train that was going to run them over, give them notice. Uh, but you weren't going to necessarily stop the train. That was the Emergency Planning Community Right to Know Act. That was passed fairly late. And it does have a purpose, but it's not resilient in terms of stopping the pollution, but it's giving you notice of the pollution. In any event, uh, throughout all of this time, we learn that many states, if they do not have, at first we learn pollution is interstate. It flows. It doesn't stop at state lines. It doesn't know to stop at state lines. Second, there's something called the race to the bottom, which you've all heard about. And that is that some state will get the bright idea that it, if it cuts all environmental protection in that state, it will get jobs <coughs> from industry. So they're, they're frankly, you know, questionable industries, but it, then the neighboring states begin to cut. It's called the race to the bottom. It happens all the time, it was going on, and there were minimum standards that are federal standards set. That's also what you're losing. So you're going to have, now some agents, some states will do, Minnesota will probably do a decent job of protecting the environment. Certain other states will do a decent job of protecting the environment, but they'll be so limited because the pollution will be coming from a neighboring state. Ah, it's like those people up in, uh, New England so, suing all of these utilities here in Ohio. Do you all know when I started, looked at my first environmental set of documents, Jack Gilligan was governor. We had a tall stacks policy in Ohio. Our way of regulating pollution was to get the tallest damn stacks you could so we could throw the pollution as far away. I think about that, I mean, honest to God, I looked at those documents, because I was on the first oversight committee of the first EPA, uh, Ohio EPA, and uh, we complained and bellyache that whatever has gotten, you know, I mean, it, it was great at the time, in its early days, compared to some of the things that have happened since then. But, you know, so, so that's, that's, the, that's what's happening. Now, what, the question is, what do citizens do? And the problem is, with all of these bad things, what's the central focus? Uh, back in 1970, I had an opportunity to not just meet, but debate for a week with a guy named Saul uh, David Alinsky, uh, who uh, was rediscovered by the Tea Party because they literally used Saul's books to organize the Tea Party. They said, we hate this guy if he were still alive. We hate everything he stands for. The thing that's missing is organization. Now Saul and I argued, and this is really ironic for that week, about how you organize the middle class. 
I didn't think I was concerned about the middle class, even though they're somewhat boring, because, because that's where we all came from, you know, the majority of us. And we were really interested in poor people and the problems of poverty and everything like that. But as a political science guy, I knew that if you ignore the prevailing power, political power, in a system, like all those people who are just like our parents, you were ignoring, ultimately you'd be very short-term faith. And guess what is occurring to some people, other than the Democrats today, that you can't ignore the middle class. And everybody pays lip service. But nobody wants to go out and understand it. Because the middle class is not a monolith. It's a whole bunch of different things. And back when Dick and I had a friend, <coughs> Carl Vogt, who was a chairman of, of, uh, of a little organization I started that was doing some of this organ organizing and uh, the drug program, heroin addiction program, and we had a recycling program and a lot of environmental stuff. But we did it in part, it was all based on going out and reaching the middle class. So in any event, in this issue of the environment, you have an organizing issue. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, certainly people have to be aware of climate change. But it really has to do with air they breathe. And guess what? Everybody in this region ought to be concerned about air pollution. Because we're way worse than New York. All of you know that, right? There's not even any question about that. Now, you can say it's because of our topography, you know, because we've in effect got a bag over our head and we're smoking a cigarette inside a bag. In other words, a lot of times the air, we're locked, locked in because of the topography. It's like a saucer in this area. And you can say, well, we can't do anything about it. Of course we can. But we're not because we're not organized around that issue. And many years ago, uh, I got one of our health commissioners I, thanks to uh, the chairman of the Board of Health, not to me, but to, to him, uh, uh, to decide that if there was an, in, if this inversion continued, he was going to request that we cut back on emissions because it's like continuing to smoke with a paper bag over your head, only for the region, because there was an inversion, and it was actually in October, it was fairly late in the year, and, you know, the weather changed, and, never had to happen and then the health commissioner actually went to prison and you know so we never we lost not over that but over some other things uh, and then then the chairman of the board of health actually was being considered for a health commissioner ironically here just recently until he took a different job so um, so in any event it's an organizing issue we need to get organized and we need to get organized around this issue now Lawyers like our law firm, the Sierra Club, Earth Justice, uh, which is a, you know, some of the legal information you may need or may not need, that's, that's one thing. But only, only by having conversations with a broad group of people about these issues and sharing some of this information, do we get it? You'll get a consensus if you do it. Now, I got to say, if you just go out and talk about climate change, that's hard for people to relate to. But you could certainly work in climate change and the destruction of science. But isn't it common sense that when you organize people, I mean, isn't that what any labor organizer, which, by the way, Alinsky originally was, you start with the concerns of the people you're organizing. You don't start with the received truth that they should need to know because that's how you can get communication and that entire program did, that we that we had um, with all those volunteers doing all those things it was based on that simple issue and that is the basis of all organizing so if you're going to organize uh, I'm getting a little old to say it but if you're going to organize <laughs> that's kind of where you you need to you need to um, need to start so uh, and, and then how do we do this? 
your indigenous, as we used to say, political sociology, to many organizations. You know, you're in many organizations. You can talk to them. Uh, you can suggest that they get involved with this. If there's another point of entry for which to reach people, but that's how you bring people together. And you have to have several messages when you go out to talk. But what is happening about destroying the environment affects the soil that, if you don't care anything, that your um, French bulldog plays in. Um, your grandchild plays in. Your great-grandchild plays in. Your grandparents, those of you that are younger, uh, who own a little place in Kentucky or somewhere else, it affects everything. And we've had the pleasure of representing people and helping them solve these problems. And little rural areas are not exempt, but neither are cities. And I'm not even going to be telling you about the sewers. I mean, you know, I mean, you know the idea that this is a mandate uh, when we're using the basement of over 10,000 homes in this area as backup storage tanks for sewage of the MSD. And that there's been a list for years of houses. All of these things, you know, it's when you get to the broader picture, when things get really bad, and you've got this house of cards of environmental enforcement, all the cards being removed out, that's the time that I, I think that's the one issue and then I don't know, I think when people start to realize that's what's happening, you don't need to convince everybody 